What we're looking at here is a game SimCity. I grew up playing games like this. What I loved about it was that it could always surprise me. Every time I played, things turned out different. It starts with a random map to play on, there are random events like hurricanes, and even the little things like where the Sim people build, build their houses and where they travel to is random. That's what a probability model is. It's a piece of code where the output is random, a simulator. Whenever I want to model something in the real world, I'd like to start with a simulator. I can run it and draw plots of the output and compare them to the real world. And I can go back and tweak my simulator until its output looks realistic. The goal of this video will be to get used to how we specify probability models. Let's start with an example. Here's a climate model of Cambridge for the data set we looked at in the last video. Have a quick read of the code. The job of this function, rtemp, is to generate a random temperature for timestamp t. It's also got some magic numbers for its other arguments. Four of them describe the shape of the sinusoid I want to use. There's alpha, the amplitude, phi, the phase shift, c, the overall average level, and gamma, the rate of temperature increase. The last one, sigma, describes how much random noise to add. The noise is numpy.random.normal, which generates a normal random variable, also called Gaussian. I've color coded these parameters in blue to stress that they're different from t. t is the time point we want to simulate. If we want to simulate a temperature in 2050, we set t equal 2050. t is at the discretion of the person using the model. It's a given, as opposed to the other parameters, which are unknowns. I've plugged in some half plausible default values in the code, but really we should be learning them from the data set. That's what machine learning is, estimating the unknown parameters of a model from the data set. And that's what we'll be learning about in a couple of videos. One more quick comment. The bottom line says random vector of temperatures. Can you spot why I get out a vector and not just a single temperature? It's NumPy vectorized code, that's why. T here refers to an entire column from the data frame, i.e. a vector. And the standard NumPy operations, if you give them a vector as input, they'll return a vector as output. So pred is a vector with one entry per row of the data set, and the return value from rtemp is also. I'll be using lots of vectorized code in all my code snippets throughout this course, because it's really tedious to write out for loops all the time. And now, here's exactly the same model but this time I've written it out in maths in what I call random variable notation. I said that the goal of this video was to get used to how we specify probability models. And there are two ways we can do this, either with code or with random variable notation. By the end of this course, I want you to be bilingual. I want you to be able to use both code and maths notation to express a model. And I want you to be able to translate between them. Code is great for getting a visceral feel for how the model behaves. We can run it and look at the output and step through with a debugger and so on. And the maths notation is better for machine learning, that is for fitting the model's parameters. To do that, we'll need to do some algebra first to derive what's called the model's likelihood function or loss function. And for that algebra, it's much better to work from the random variable notation. So that's what the rest of this video will all be about, the conventions behind the random variable notation. We'll work through some simple examples, and then by the end of the video, you should be perfectly happy writing down expressions like this one here for temperature. Okay, let's start with a simple example. First, when you write u, open bracket, 0, comma 1, that just means the standard uniform distribution between 0 and 1, all values equally likely. The special symbol tilde means generate or sample x from the uniform distribution. Next example. This code generates a random variable for x and then another one for i, and I've written them in capital letters. That's the convention, uppercase for random variables. Every time we run the code, we get a different value for x and a different value for i. 
A and B are just plain values and we'll use lowercase for those. Next point. Sometimes you see random variables wrapped up in functions, like I've done in these two cases, and the function notation makes it abundantly clear this is a random function and each time I run it I get a different answer. But it's still random even when the commands are written in a script like this example at the bottom. OK, next example. In this code, x1 and x2 are generated independently. Knowing the value of 1 gives no information about the other. In maths notation, it's usually implied that random variables are meant to be generated independently unless we explicitly state otherwise. Like in this next piece of code, the two values y and z in this code are most definitely not independent. If I see that y is large, that means x1 and x2 must be large, so z will be large. In maths notation, we could write it like this to tell the reader that y and z are potentially not independent. By the way, I'm sticking my, to my convention here, capital M, to indicate that my rand pair is a random pair of variables. Next example. This one's slightly tricky. In this piece of code, x1 and x2 are generated independently. That's clear from the way the code is written. But you might look at the code and think, well, if I find out that x1 is low, probably that means that the parameter lambda is low, so x2 is probably low too. So they're not independent because knowing x1 will tell me something about x2. But that's not right. That's not what independence means. Independence means x1 doesn't tell me anything about x2, assuming that I know the values of all the non-random parameters. Stick that in sotto voce, independent given the values of the parameters. It's worth saying one more thing about this twiddle symbol that we've been using. When we write A twiddles B, it means A and B have the same distribution. Another way of saying this is if I plot a histogram of A values, and I plot a histogram of B values, then the two histograms will be the same. Twiddles is not actually a statement about how A was generated. So for example, X twiddles U of not one, but it's also perfectly legitimate to say Y twiddles U of not one. Or in words, Y has the uniform distribution. We didn't generate y by calling the uniform random number generator. The twiddles is a mathematical statement which says that the distributions are equal. If you want to make a statement about equality of values, that's where you use the equal sign, a equals b. a equals b means that whenever you run the code, the equality holds. Again, this is a maths equality. I wrote here the equation y equals one minus x but I could just as well have written it the other way around, x equals 1 minus y, or x plus y equals 1, or however I like. So to recap, in maths notation, twiddles means that two random variables have the same distribution, and equals means that there's an algebraic equality. Neither of them is an assignment operation. And as computer scientists, you should know very well that assignment operations and algebraic equalities are two totally different things. OK, last example. If you see a random variable on the right-hand side of a twiddles expression, like here, you can read it as, first of all, generate x, and then, given that value of x, use that to generate y, like the code on the left does. Technically, that's not exactly what it means. It's really just another twiddle statement saying that two distributions are identical. But it takes quite a lot of technical work to even get to the point where we can state this properly, work that we won't cover for two weeks. So for now, just read it as generate x first and then generate y using x. OK, so that's the notation. Now let's have another look at our climate model. I'm using an uppercase name for the random variable we generate, and I'm using lowercase letters for all the parameters and constants. I've written a twiddles because I'm specifying a distribution 
not writing down an algebraic equality. And I've written this equation out with subscripts. This just means that there are n separate equations, one for each row of the data set, and each equation has its own normal random variable for noise. And our convention says that all these noise terms shall be independent because I haven't explicitly stated otherwise. Let's look at another example. This dataset comes from an astronomy paper published in 1986 about large-scale structure in the universe. We know the universe is expanding, so the galaxies we can observe are moving away from us, and the speed can be measured by redshift. Now, imagine the universe were uniform, with galaxies studded through it like cherries in a fruitcake, then we'd expect to see a smooth distribution of galaxy speeds. But if the universe is made up of filaments of galaxies with great big voids between them, then when we plot a histogram of galaxy speeds, we'll see the speeds clustered, and that's what this data set shows. The exercise here is to come up with a probability model, in other words, to define a function that returns a random galaxy speed. I've written it here as a function that returns a list of given length. All the NumPy random number generators take an argument called size and return a list, so we might as well do the same. Pause the video here and think how you'd implement this function. Your function should mimic the dataset. It should produce clusters of values, some speeds around 10,000 and some speeds around 22,000 that should be quite likely, but speeds in the middle of that range should be unlikely. Think about what parameters your function might need to achieve this. And when you're ready, press play. Here's my simulator. And here's some simulation output. Pause the video, read through the code, and see if you can figure out how I made it produce clustered values. And compare it to the code you came up with. Is yours a better model for the data? Is it simpler? My code is what's called a Gaussian mixture model. It says there are to be three clusters, clusters one, two, and three, and the code first chooses a cluster at random, call it K, and then it samples a Gaussian random variable with a mean and standard deviation specific to that cluster K. Okay, next question. How would you write out this model in random variable notation? Pause the video, stop and think, and press play when you're ready. This is really just about vocabulary. There are some standard random variables that everyone in machine learning uses all the time, and it's worth just knowing their names. Here I'm using the categorical random variable, which is a name for a random selection from a list. It just means return one with probability p1, two with probability p2, three with probability p3. And next, we sample a value, let's call it big X, from a normal distribution with parameters mu1 and sigma1 if k is one, mu2 and sigma2 if k is two, and so on. In maths notation, indexing starts at one, but in Python it starts at zero, which is a bit of a pain. Okay. There's nothing really much to this example. The thing to take away from it is, first, it's useful to know a repertoire of standard random variables like the normal and the categorical to give us building blocks for more interesting probability models. And that's what the next video will be about. The second thing to take away from this example is this particular model, the Gaussian mixture model, which is worth having up your sleeve if you're ever trying to locate clusters in a data set. When we train this model, in other words, when we fit the parameters, we get out a list of mu values, in other words, the center of each cluster, and the other parameters tell us the weights and the sizes of the clusters. A lot of machine learning is like this. You come across a nifty little model and you add it to your toolbox. And next time you're faced with a similar problem, you can use that tool. To finish, let's go back to SimCity. This is a random simulation. In other words, it's a probability model, but it's a bit different to the climate model and the galaxy model, because in SimCity it runs a step-by-step -step simulation, something random happening every time step, and crucially, 
feeding into the next time step. This type of model is called a Markov probability model, and in the last week of the course we'll look at Markov models more carefully.